I'm very happy to have Jerry Woodall with us. Hi, Jerry. Hi. <clears throat> Jerry is uh, from Purdue. I assume, Jerry, uh, in each case that we do interviews, people have read your bio because we've got the book. And, um, but, but a couple of highlights, National Medal of Science. Technology, close enough. Okay. And uh, uh, you have a, a kind of a three-pronged scientific background, interest, research. Yes. What are those three areas? Well, the three areas are uh, I've been working on compound semiconductors since uh, I think 1789, somewhere around there. Got a prize at IBM. All at IBM. Yep. And, uh, and so during that period, I was working on high-speed devices, uh, a couple of them in your cell phone, actually, mm -hmm. and uh, worked on solar cells. And uh, more recently, I've been working mo on solar cells and storing energy to convert uh, water into a hydrogen, as mm -hmm. you know, this morning. And also, I'm working on very high-speed devices things will run in the terahertz regime. Wow. And, and there's a little photonic story in there somewhere too, I think. Is that right, photonics? And, yes. Yeah. Uh, well, the reason that we're here together, about uh, four years ago, I think, we had Jeffrey Ballard here. You may know him. Yeah. And uh, we were talking about fuel cells, father of all fuel cells kind of thing, and mm -hmm. uh, the hydrogen economy. And we've had a number of people, Amory Lovins has been here, and. Uh, each time we talk to somebody who's an expert, we kind of hit a wall. And that wall is, in some of the words like distribution, uh, oil companies blocking things, and uh, explosions. <laughs> words like that. <laughs> thermal, thermal events, un unscheduled thermal events. Unscheduled. Yeah. So uh, a, a primary reason I, I was so fascinated with the work that you've done lately is because it seems perhaps to break through all those ideas. Could you, could you describe uh, in any length you want to what you've done? Sure. Uh, I would like a disclaimer on hydrogen though, because I have, you know, hydrogen is still controversial how it's going to get used. You know, is it going to be serious or not? We didn't, mm -hmm. you know, Vinod did not mention much about last night. And so my view is that uh, uh, if hydrogen becomes interesting, fuel cells make it and all that sort of stuff, then mm -hmm. I have a way of doing it safely. I can, I can store energy. The aluminum uh, has almost as much energy as uh, coal. And if you can make it split water, which I've learned how to do, uh, you now have a way of storing energy safely, moving it from point A to point B, and then making hydrogen when you want it. Yeah. Well, let's just, for the, for, the, for the crowd, let's go back in that moment, that day when you accidentally poured something ah. into something and then... Okay, in my, in my previous life at IBM, I had, um, I'm the guy that worked on some of the first heterojunctions. These are things that enable compound semiconductor lasers and most of the stuff that's out there right now. Mm -hmm. uh, I won't go into the details of, the, of what, how the heterojunctions actually work, but one of the materials is a compound alloy called gallium aluminum arsenide. So it's got gallium and aluminum, and half the crystal is made of arsenic. And that, you can change the ratio and get different colors of light coming out of the crystal. It does other functional things for high-speed devices also. Anyway, the technique that I was using uh, is, was called liquid phase epitaxy. So if you've ever grown sugar crystals as a kid, sure. put a string in there, you yep. make hot water, saturate with sugar, cool it down or evaporate the water, you get the crystals hanging off the strings, like the swizzles you can mm -hmm. buy. Yep. Well, the same thing happens in liquid phase epitaxy. You stick a gallium arsenide wafer in a solution, cool it down, you get a layer that works very nicely for things. Anyway, at the end of the run, since uh, you know, I was one of the guys uh, working on blue sky stuff, so I even had a good budget, but I decided to save the crucibles that I did this in. So there's this little melt of gallium with some aluminum left over from it. So I'm there whistling away, you know, I turn the water on and foom. <laughs> so this thing starts steaming. And I thought it was boiling, but it was actually hydrogen coming off. So, uh, so I went to my office like anybody would do and said, what the hell just happened? You know, so I sat there for about Did you smell hydrogen? Did you have any? So I sat there and figured it out. It's very simple. Uh, and it gets back to the story of aluminum. Aluminum, as you know, is a very safe metal. You use it for everything, you know. And uh, once you figure out how to get rid of this passive ink oxide, it's called Al2O3 or alumina, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, very, it's very reactive. I mean, for our crowd, we'd call it aluminum rust. You know, it would be the same thing. It's so an when, when oxide you, layer. 
Aluminum rust, the neat thing about it is it's, a, it's very passive. So uh, once you have elemental aluminum around, it's not going to rust away like iron. And so in the case of this liquid, so imagine all this aluminum, these atoms running around. They diffuse the top. You put water there. It grabs the water, splits it, leaves a little puddle of aluminum oxide, which is floating around. So there's no way of passivating that surface, okay? So, mm -hmm. so the thing uh, is that that was the original discovery. And when you say passivated, what you mean is to remove that aluminum oxide layer somehow. Right. In the case of this, this aluminum being in, dissolved into a liquid metal, mm -hmm. namely gallium, mm -hmm. uh, there's no way that's going to happen. So any aluminum that goes up to the water aluminum interface or the uh, alloy interface yeah. is going to, going to make hydrogen. Right. Well, that was kind of easy. So, but uh, since, since there are business people here, you look at this, wrote a patent, so it was all covered. You say, am I going to use all this gallium? No way. It's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we had a patent on it, and it was a very interesting piece of science. But at, at that stage of, of the development of it, it just was a, a, an interesting curiosity. Isn't the gallium recycled? Oh, you can recycle it, but you, you ask how much you would need if you wanted to go this route. Mm -hmm. There ain't enough on the plant to do right. it. Okay. So um, that's, that was how it all began. And I, as I said, I worked on this at IBM, and it sat, sat around uh, dormant for, until 2004. And I was at Yale at the time. And then so the dean of engineering there, Paul Fleury, said, uh, you know, people are worried about energy again, Jerry. You might want to take a look at this again. So what I decided to do is I said, well, OK, let me make a small puddle of this stuff and just add lots of aluminum. So if I take the system percent of gallium, I got it down, you get down to one or two percent. You say, well, that's economically viable probably. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The problem is when you try to feed this aluminum in after you've reacted whatever you had there, it doesn't go into solution again. I saw your, your <sighs> paper on that. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a bummer. Are you still working on that? Well, I don't work on that particular project, but I mm -hmm. might go back to it. I haven't given up on that, but no. I found another way out. And that's one of the reasons we're sitting here. We mm -hmm. found another way of doing it. Okay. Which is? And that is... It turns out, to my surprise, if you actually add a lot more aluminum to make aluminum-rich alloys, these alloys will split water. So now we're at the point where we can 95 weight percent of aluminum, mm -hmm. 5 weight percent of the gallium, and we actually use a mixture of gallium and even tin, mm -hmm. known as gallon stand, and that works beautifully. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just two weeks ago we figured out why it works. We've been working on that very hard, you know. I, my day job is still being a professor, so I'm try to get my uh, people interested in this process, yeah. but uh, we finally figured it out, and it turns out that just a, it's a very unique system. Aluminum is one of the, f uh, gallium is one of the few metals that you can dissolve into solid aluminum. It's called an alloy. You can make liquids easily, but in this case, indium does not dissolve in, uh, in, uh -huh. uh, in aluminum, and neither does tin at room temperature. But gallium, you can put up to 20% in there, and that changes the density of aluminum just enough to be a mismatch to the oxide, and that's what makes the thing go. Mm -hmm. So we finally understand it now. So there's actually a dissolving process that goes on from solid so, to solid. So, right, so we just heat the aluminum up, and we add these little you know, 5% gallium and indium and tin, cool it back down, you have this little ingot. Mm -hmm. just think, of, think of a chunk of coal, yeah. so it's an ingot of this material. Good metaphor. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> or a chunk of it, whatever you want. Yeah. And, uh, that, that works with water very well. So let's say we're at that, we've been through this whole process. It's not very hot, so it's, we're talking about 200 degrees or something like that? Or is what, the, uh, the process of creating that ingot? Oh, no, so when you melt aluminum down, that's at 660 degrees centigrade. Yeah. It's not very high. Yeah. No, you can't even see the heat. It's but the water has to be heated for the... No, no, room temperature. Room temperature, okay. So you haven't wasted very much energy in the process. And no, what you, end, you end up with this ingot... If you, you give me the ingot, I take it home, and I put this in a bucket, of, a bucket, and I add water. And off comes the hydrogen. You get hydrogen, heat, and aluminum oxide, and the, the alloy that was there is inert so you can recover it. Right. So um, I create hydrogen. I run my house heating. I run my car. Uh, it runs out. Eventually, I've used up all the uh, elemental aluminum. I bring it back to you, or your company, somebody. And I get a new bucket. Correct. So, so, let me, so let me tell you what I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. uh, 
So, you know, GM is going to announce this Volt in 2010. And so yep. it's an electric vehicle, right? Yep. It means it's plug and play. Yep. Now, it's, it's designed currently on their plans for, for a 40-mile range. Yep. Okay. Okay, suppose you charge your batteries up. And let's suppose it all works out for a moment. You know, I don't know that it will. We mm -hmm. heard Vinod's view of that last night, but it, suppose it does. So, you're, so you drive to and from work, you know, 33, aver three mile, 33 miles is the average commuting distance. And uh, suppose you want to stop by Aunt Sadie's or play poker someplace. Mm -hmm. Okay, you get in there and you turn ignition and you're out of electrons, right? Uh -huh. So what GM is doing now is they have an internal combustion engine that Three -cylinder will engine. have, they will have hydrogen, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. They'll have uh, gasoline to get you home. Yeah. So what I propose is that we could, with, with six, six pounds of this alloy, you know, plug it in a canister in the back, you can switch over to hydrogen, mm -hmm. run the hydrogen in the internal combustion engine, not as good as fuel cells, and then that runs the, the generator, which gets you home. So you get 30 Just miles. through the internal combustion engine. Well, really? so, so the idea. So Hydrogen get, through the internal combustion engine. Yeah, you just put, so you don't, so what, you know, these hybrids, they don't usually use, uh, they usually drive electric generators and stuff like that, mm -hmm. the Prius and all that. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is it's all electric, but you use the internal combustion engine to drive the electric generator, which then gets you home. Now, the Prius, of course, is always charging the batteries or the other hybrids, but this will just get you home. So you, you get out, you take the canister out, it's only six pounds, and you put the, a new one in on your shelf, and you go back to AutoZone or Walmarts or your favorite place. And now wow. what the, the nice thing about this model is that the company who's making the car doesn't have to put this as part of their supply chain. Mm -hmm. They can let the companies who are have these canisters, they send them back to Alcoa or Arusol yeah. or somebody and regenerate the alloy. Wow. I think it's going to work. You've, you've picked the simplest, most accessible, least politically difficult <laughs> path theory, haven't you? But it, it works, huh? Yeah. I had no idea you could run hydrogen in, a, in that engine. Oh, yeah. Look, um, Honda makes a Genset. This is, you know, an engine Generator. ICE running a, a dynamo. Mm -hmm. And uh, they sell them for, for running hydrogen now. Is it your thought that it's more efficient to do that, or would it be more efficient for them just to have a fuel cell engine in the car? Hands down, fuel cells are the way to go. Yeah. The only reason I say that is that it, they're more efficient by a factor of three. Wow. And, uh, and so uh, there's a lot of work. You know, GM has got a big hydrogen group, 50 mm -hmm. people or so. Mm -hmm. uh, Larry Burns, if you've talked to him lately, he wants to bet the company on hydrogen. Well, I'll be standing by for him <laughs> if it all <laughs> works out. Remember, though, I've got to manage the heat, though. Remember, I got <clears> heat in this reaction, so I have to do something with it. Mm -hmm. So either I uh, use it somehow effectively, but you know, automobiles, you know, only 30, 20 or 30 percent of the gasoline power comes out as wheel, wheel uh, of right, power, right, and the rest right. is going up the radiator and out the it's exhaust. It's heat and other things, yeah. But the fuel gills, the fuel cell guys, they have to run these things at 80 degrees, 80 degrees C, mm -hmm. and so they, they don't want any more heat problems floating around. So it'll be some, some engineering must be done if the fuel cells actually make it. I'll be standing by. Mm -hmm. it, but it sounds to me, and I think, and, and it looks to me from reading the things that you've written, that this all works. Yeah. It's not as though not, it doesn't no, work. This there's, works. There's no showstoppers. And, and uh, you haven't asked me the question, but I'm, I'm keen on sustainability. And there's enough aluminum in the I planet. meant to ask you, but you don't. Yeah. So he's, that's his <laughs> next question he's going to ask me, sustainability, right? There's an, you mind if I pull out a piece of paper so I give you no, the numbers, no, right? Yep, so. He told me no PowerPoint, so this is my PowerPoint here. Okay. Okay. So it turns out there are 10 trillion kilograms of aluminum reserve. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's enough to make 5 times 10 to the 13th or 50, uh, um, 50 trillion kilowatt hours as hydrogen, okay? The annual U.S. usage is about four times 10 to the ninth or four billion kilowatt hours. I mean, people have to go from watts to kilowatts, so you just have to factor of a thousand yeah. euro sign to see yeah. how that works. So, so from a sustainability, there's plenty of it, but check this out. I just discovered two, three weeks ago, since the beginning of the manufacturing of aluminum, 
you know, back in 1887 or when they started mm -hmm. for, for real, not too much was made that year, but that was the start. That'd be the year before this hotel was built. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there's been 700 billion kilograms made. Okay. Okay. Of that 700 billion, you know, it doesn't oxidize very rapidly. Mm -hmm. If you leave it for a billion years in the ground, it will, but not, not a few years, so it's stable. So now you take that, so 300 billion kilograms have been recycled, mm -hmm. but 400 billion kilograms of aluminum is lying in scrap bins. That's enough to run 100 million cars 200 miles. Now, now why is that important? So if this thing is going to take, if this is going to be big and global like we heard last night, that's the criterion, which I believe sincerely. Scales. You know, there's plenty of niche stuff that'll go on, but yeah. we're, we're talking about, you know, responding to quick changes in, in climate issues, right? right. So right. this is totally green. And uh, so there you have to have an inventory. So because people are driving and there's got to be somebody re refining this aluminum oxide back to aluminum. That's mm -hmm. done with electricity, mm -hmm. 30 cents a... 30 cents a pound. Yep, yep. And so, so the sustainability issue looks very promising because there's, it's the third most abundant metal on the planet's surface. Yeah. Well, that's what I love about it. It's just a, it's just a circle. Yeah. It's like the hydrologic cycle. It's just simple. Right. So people are always asking me, he says, well, you got to put energy back in this. Yeah, I, 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 I believe <laughs> in the first law of thermodynamics. <laughs> I mean, look, even, even oil has to be part of the first law. Yeah. It just took millions of years to get it. Right, right. So, so the, the, the thing that makes this more interesting than electrolysis is I can separate putting the energy back into the aluminum from getting the energy back out as hydrogen. Think about it. Suppose you have a battery or something, you want to make hydrogen on site, mm -hmm. you know, in a car or something like that. It does, it's sort of an oxymoron to take the electricity to, to make a hydrogen. But this way, I can make it off site mm -hmm. at the plant. Yep. Put it in, yep. I've got all I got to do is add water. There's plenty of water. Yeah. And it also takes the idea, which is kind of a dogmatic idea today, that hydrogen is a currency, it's not a fuel. Right. And it, and it flips that. Hydrogen is now a fuel, and the aluminum is the currency. Right. Well, I like to think of it as carbon without, I mean, uh, coal without a carbon footprint, because yeah. they have about the same energy content. Uh-huh. So, if this is such a great idea, why aren't we doing it tonight? Right. Now, you know what happened to me? Some guy from CNN called me on the phone. He says, what's, so what's holding up the revolution? <laughs> and every now and then I, I lose my head and say the wrong thing. I said, well, <clears throat> the guys at DOE are not excited about this. Oh, boy, was that a mistake. Jeez. So I, had to, I spent weeks you know, saying, well, they just don't know about it yet. You know, I had to I, yeah, talk yeah. about a guy backtracking. It's like a politician. Re it's like a politician <laughs> saying, I didn't really didn't mean to say that. Yeah. <laughs> So the revolution, we got to remember, uh, Mark, that uh, the, the stuff that we have now that's economically viable, you know, keep track of the time here, is economically yeah. viable, was just discovered about six months ago. So we have to give it a chance to get, uh, get out there. Well, I don't mean you're not going fast enough. I just mean I'm trying to give you an opportunity to express to us, because we have a lot of guys here who might be able to help you. What are the roadblocks now? Okay, depends on what you want to do. Um, um, I, I really believe there, there are two things that could actually move forward if, if we had a big enough infrastructure. I didn't tell you. So think about a, a diesel electric freight train, 4,000 horsepower engine. You know, they go from zero to 60 in 10 minutes or whatever. So, so while it's cruising along, uh, you're using about 2,000 horsepower. Suppose you use this aluminum to enrich the diesel by about 15%. Now, this is not a vetted number. There, there are numbers in the literature that say you can get up to 30% increase in efficiency. You get rid of the soot. You don't need blue tech to get rid of the NOx and all that stuff. 60,000 gallon tanker of my alloy will run a train with a 15% enrichment for 550 days. So I back into the plant. I got two tanks. I got 550 the, days. 550 days. So you pour the aluminum <coughs> in the top, dump, sorry, you dump out the aluminum oxide, they, they feed it back in the system to make new alloy. You put the alloy and then you have the water tank next to it connected, and now you're feeding in the hydrogen to enrich the diesel for the diesel electric. Wow. So I think that one actually could start pretty soon. Have you talked to GE about that? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. So you got to remember, I'm... I know, my, I know. My date. <laughs> so, so I make, I send emails and I keep my students going, you know, what yeah. the hell. I sleep once in a while. Has GE responded? Up. 
No, GE hasn't. I'm talking to, actually, I'm talking to a guy who's working with the Florida East Coast Railroad right now, and they're thinking about the, the nice thing about this is that they, they have some test engines they could actually try this out on. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you're talking, with 4,000 4, horsepower, we're not talking about a little puddle like you see in my laboratory. You've got to actually make this stuff up yeah. and try it out. That's yeah. an investment. Yeah. You know, you, it's going to be an investment cost to do that. So I'm not going to rec- anybody, recommend anybody to assume they run out and buy stock in aluminum right now. Uh-huh. Uh, but all I wanted to say is that we have, the, what I would say is that we have a pathway to enable the hydrogen economy. And that's about all I want to you know, brag about at this point in time. That's enough. Yeah, we're proud at the point we should take questions here. Oh, uh, sure. Can we bring the house lights up a little bit? Yeah, and, I can't and, see out there, so you're going to have to find the, the hands. I think if we they're... have spotters and we have people with microphones. So if you guys have questions but from Jerry, things like how do you create a revolution? There's somebody <laughs> raising his hand in the back. Okay. Hi, Jim. We have a microphone somewhere coming to you. Uh, having... Having done a lot of uh, prototype and development, uh, how far are we away from a scalable, actually go do it plant? Can you turn the microphone up, please? Maybe you can interpret. I didn't hear the question. Uh, he's, I think he said, having done prototypes, how far are we away from? The real thing. The real thing. Again, uh, my, I'm not trying to be uh, evasive. The, the answer to that depends on how you want to introduce it in the marketplace. Uh, one of the things that we're trying to do is to make a uh, standby power for uh, medically fragile patients in Indiana. Mm-hmm. It turns out that if the grid goes down and Duke sends out four or five guys at $100 an hour per person with a kit to keep the uh, refrigerator going for the diabetic medicine and the oxygen generator. And so this would, this, this would actually be very, this would work right off the bat. We're actually trying to build prototypes or actually real systems right now. Uh, but that's not a big deal yet. I mean, so, so if you're asking the question, how long would it take to, be, to go global? I, can't, I don't know the answer to that. So there's infrastructure of some type that has to be done, which is not done yet. You can't go to a filling station and fill it up with aluminum yet. So I think that what you're saying is there's a development process that still has to happen. Yes. But there isn't a lot of research. But there's no showstoppers. Yeah, it's not a research-based This stuff problem. works every time. You I need was... to scale it up, have larger containers, figure out what happens in... I thought about bringing out a little glass of water and dump one in for you, but I figure, well. <laughs> like Richard Feynman. <laughs> uh, do we have any other questions? Going once. I think we do over there. Yeah, front row. Uh, I actually have two questions. Uh, first, Turn the mic up, please. I have two questions. First, what's the source of the gallium? You know, in, in what geopolitical part of the world is that stuff mined? And, and second, what happens if I pulverize these bricks, uh, add hot steam, and try to create an explosive? That's a good question. As you probably already know, from the, I'll answer the pulver, pulverizing issue first. Uh, if you make a, aluminum, very fine powder, and store it in nitrogen, and open it up, it'll blow up in your face. Uh, we have not studied the pulverized material very much because we don't need to pulverize it to make it work. It works in the form of bricks. And so I asked the question, well, why bother do that unless you have a special thing in mind? I mean, the density of aluminum is only a 2.7, so the little bit of uh, alloy doesn't raise it very much. So a gallon of aluminum has more energy than a gallon, a gallon of diesel or uh, far more than a gallon of liquid hydrogen. Um, so... Uh, Repeat your, the first part of your question. So I, we haven't done any measurements on pulverizing the, uh, the alloy yet. Oh, the gallon. Um, so, so there's plenty of gallium around. Uh, the things that worry me a little bit, but we may not need indium, is that uh, there's not as much indium around. But there's enough gallium, if you recycle it, and you don't lose this, the, ga- the gallium is totally inert. In fact, let me give you a simple mental model. Think of a metal that has the thermodynamic energy to split water. Mm -hmm. So all you have to do is get rid of that passivating oxide. Mm -hmm. You take a material like gallium that cannot split water, that takes care of the, makes it, it depassivates the oxide. And now you, the gallium, you can put gallium in oxygen-free water. It's just shiny. It'll stay there for 100 years. It doesn't dissolve. 
So you just recover it and put it back in again, over and over again. We had a student last summer, an intern, who ran this thing about 50 times and never lost any gallium at all. Mm -hmm. So the gallium comes from the U.S. mostly, uh, which is nice. Uh, there's not much bauxite in uh, Saudi Arabia or, or gallium. Whatever, if that worries you. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, couldn't that's resist. a good thing. I, I couldn't thing. resist that. Yeah. Okay, so, so the gallium comes from the U.S., and there's plenty of it. And so, Jerry, I've seen some numbers, but I would like to get them back from you. Compared, in terms of gas prices and so forth, give the folks a, a okay. shot. Okay. So, so, if we recycle, so, oh, I didn't tell you, the, so, so I got a minute or two, just a minute. So, look, so this, so you have to ask the question, why is there 400 billion kilograms of aluminum on the planet, Okay. The answer is very simple. The, the business model for aluminum is take the bauxite, mm -hmm. clean it, make it aluminum oxide, get it to four nines purity, 99.99%. They ship it around the world, and then they make the alloy by, by electrolyzing it for 30 cents a pound. But so, so the can company wants 2.5% magnesium. The engine companies want 2.5% silicon. So here's all this muttly aluminum lying around, it costs more to purify that aluminum again than to, than to purify bauxite. Mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't matter about mine. I can use anything. Mm -hmm. Mine's a garbage can in a sense. Sure. This works on anything. So yeah. I actually was using soda cans the other day. It's kind of fun. You just <laughs> squash them up and throw them in the furnace and melt it down. So, so, so the price, <coughs> if you had to recycle aluminum oxide, it's 30 cents a pound nowadays, but you have to have a low cost electrical, electrical supply. Getting back to what we heard last night about solar farms. So you think about how you would store energy when you're not using it on the grid. You make aluminum from aluminum oxide. You just put it in a tanker car or pipes and ship it on out. So, um, uh, and it went, at night you can use windmills Yes. To uh, use the low-cost electricity to do aluminum oxide back to aluminum and that. Yeah. For that. Well, We're well, running I think, over I time. I think Vinod missed a number of important things. This would be one of them. But, uh, and so when you compare it to gas prices. Ah, okay. So at, at 30 cents a pound recycling the aluminum and recycling the gallium, we can, we can, we can, get, uh, we can, we can make this for the same price as gasoline at three fifty two dollars and fifty cents a gallon right now. Three fifty? I heard it was four dollars today, wasn't it? Somewhere? Yeah, it's over four dollars. So at three fifty you're even. You're breaking even, yeah. So you're ahead of the game today. Yeah, you gotta remember aluminum prices are gonna look, anytime you perturb a market, I know, Mark, I know. come on. <laughs> you <laughs> Tomorrow perturb the market, the, the aluminum prices. The Wall will Street go up. jackals will get in there yeah. and take care of the whole problem for us. <laughs> Triple it in no, no time. Well So it, right now it, it's competitive. We're, I'm really pleased to have you with us, and I think what you're doing is amazing. You're obviously a brilliant guy, but you're a brilliant guy doing something which the world needs, and that's more unusual. Well, as you know in life, the key thing is to have fun. Yeah. You have fun? My students don't understand. It's the first thing I ask them in class. What's the most important thing in life? The answer is to have fun. And you're having fun. Yeah. Good. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.